everybody. Thanks for tuning in to Border City Rock Talk. We get great news, great interviews, great interviewees with sometimes a comedic touch. Before we get my guest on, JJ French, Twisted Sister, please hit the like button and subscribe to the channel or JJ might kick your ass. Not true, JJ. How are you doing? Well, we're from New York City, so we'll send somebody to kick your ass. You know, that's how that works. We'll, we'll just send somebody named Vito up to take care of you. Yeah, from Montreal. Yeah, I understand. And um, yeah. So I pity the fool that doesn't I don't know how many I don't know how many vetoes you have in Montreal. We got a lot of them down here in Brooklyn, though, you know. Yeah. <laughs> That's where you're uh, you're located. So I wanted to get you on, but before we do get into this great interview, a uh, quick word from our sponsor. Competition calls Sudsley Brewright. <laughs> Sudsley, on the night in question, how many did you see the defendant kill? Seven in one night? What kind of a monster could do that? A party monster! Drinking the new convenient Dove Seven Pack! <laughs> the Dove Seven Pack! One more for the road! There's nothing symmetrical about flavor! So get your Seven Pack today! It looks wrong, but it is oh so right. Oh yeah. So, um, JJ, so just to rehash a bit, obviously, Twisted Sister, everybody knows, everybody's coming to this interview for that. My favorite song, as I told um, D uh, recently, was The Price. And I just did a little bit of research. I wanted to find out exactly who co who wrote it and everything. But I came across something interesting. Um, was it your uh, sister in law that kind of gave D the the price you got to pay part of the lyric? Yeah, yeah, that was based on a conversation. Well, we were I'm sure D related the story. We were recording. Um, you can't stop rock and roll. We were living in an, in a house in England, Jimmy Page's house, as a matter of fact. We were recording in Jimmy Page's studio. And um, we were isolated and we were away from our families because we didn't have much of a budget and couldn't afford to bring people over. And Dee had just had a son. So he was really lonely and missing his family. And my sister-in-law, Ricky, called to talk to me and Dee was telling Ricky how much he missed his family. And she said, well, that's the price you have to pay. I guess that's what she, to sum it up, I think she said, that's the price you have to pay for success or going after your dreams, which... D is related as a story so yeah actually d recently has said that um <clears throat> excuse me the um and I, I didn't read the article but i'm pretty good at getting the gist of headlines he was he said in an article uh, or an interview um that a lot of the fans are the reason for today's um uh song or musicians um having a harder time um making ends meet uh via pirating music so Relations to that, is your sister-in-law getting any royalties? <laughs> she got a nice gold record from D, I think. Oh, right. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully she didn't sell it, but hey, the price of gold is up there, and that's another spot. No, I'm just joking. Um, I wanted to bring you on to talk about the book, um, and I heard you on the uh, famous Canadian uh, overnight talk radio guy. Uh, Richard Serrett, not just overnight, uh, but he was on Coast to Coast. We talked really uh, for a couple of minutes before we went on the air about how you do the same thing as I do. I do it to this day. I listen to reruns of Art Bell and Coast to Coast to help me fall asleep. But I heard you on that uh, Richard Serrett uh, describing your book. So just give the viewers a bit of a, a synopsis of the book and what it's about and then where they can go and purchase it. Because I understand it's a... Uh, you're selling lots of copies, even to this yeah, day. It's, it's on Amazon. It's called Twisted Business. Um, it's a business. It's 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 both a business book and a and a memoir. It's a I call it a biz war. It's a business book and a memoir. I coined the phrase biz war. Um, so uh, when you get into the motivational speaking world, like I did, uh, the first thing that someone says to you is, "Do you have a book?" Like that's a big deal to, to give these speeches. You know, do you have a book? And I didn't have a book. And my mentor, Steve Farber, who's my co-writer here. Who's a who's a best-selling author and and a wonderful motivational speaker, and my mentor, as I said, um, said we should write a book. So 
I, people said to me, what's a good book's going to be about? It's going to be about Twisted Sister. It's going to be about your life. It's going to be about Twisted Sister. You manage Twisted Sister. Is it a business book? Is it a memoir? And I felt like I was going back and forth. It's a business book. It's a memoir. It's a business book. It's a memoir. So it's a biz war. It's a combination of both. The beginning of the book is a memoir of my growing up. And then it goes into the, the, the Twisted Sister history, which started in 1972. Actually, it's 50 years ago. And um, in the book... I, 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 I teach what is known as the twisted method of reinvention. When I do my speaking engagements, I discuss the, the seven principles, which is T-W-I-S-T-E-D, twisted. It's very simple to remember, twisted, right? The seven yeah. principles, T-W-I-S-T-E-D, tenacity, wisdom, inspiration, stability, trust, excellence, and discipline. And in the book, I describe all of it. And at the end of the book, in the back of the book, when I talk about tenacity, I've got all the 9,000 shows that the band played uh since the beginning all this wow. yeah it's crazy nine thousand performances how how was how easy like i understand you, you were management with the band in the band but how easy or how difficult was it to locate all those shows i mean were you very punctual and everything you wrote down you kept you didn't talk yeah, yeah i'm an archivist but you know the band was the band uh, came out at a very unique time when um, the club scene in Long Island was very, very fertile and very, very big. And so as a young band, you could always get work. Now people can't get work. Bands have a tough time. But we were a cover band. You know, we did other people's material. We started out doing Bowie and Lou Reed and Mott the Hoople and evolved over time and covered, you know, Alice Cooper and Black Sabbath and Van Halen and ACDC before we finally you know, hit our stride as an original band, but we were around during a unique period of time in the, in the industry, in the new, in the Northeast where there was hundreds of clubs. And as you became more popular, you made more money. So we were able to became, to become very successful and make money while we were pursuing our dream of a record deal that does not exist today. But back in those days, you could easily work 250 nights a year. You could work every day of the year if you wanted to. There was, that's that's how much work there was available. That's how many clubs there were. And if you wanted to work seven days a week every day, uh, you could, because that's how much. And 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 the clubs were within a fifty mile radius of each other. So we're not talking about driving, you know, hundreds of miles to a show. Mm -hmm. We're talking like look at Manhattan, draw a fifty mile radius uh, from Manhattan, and you've got you know back then a thousand clubs that you could play at. And the clubs took a little longer than an hour to get to. So it was very simple to do it. Very unusual. Never happened again. It was a certain period of time that enabled us to to learn our craft. So in, in the Brooklyn area right now, um, what percentage would you say has the club live music industry tapered off or died? Well, that's an interesting question. You know, um, when a when a 20-year-old musician comes to me and says, they want advice. And I said, my life, my life and your life is not the same life. And they go, what do you mean? I said, well, our world and your world are not the same world. When we started out, gasoline was only 23 cents a gallon. Mm -hmm. Nixon was president. There was hundreds of clubs. You could rent a house for $300 a month. You could rent a truck for $25 a week. Um, you made 150 to $300 a night. So you could easily afford everything because everything was so cheap. Uh, and there was a record industry that you could aspire to become connected to that doesn't exist today. Gas is $5 a gallon, a house rentals $3,000 a week, a truck rentals $300 a week, and you're still making the same $150 to $200 a night. I don't mathematically know how you do it. Well, I kind of do. I do know you have to be social media. You have to be on top of social media, yeah. and you have to be able to sell merch at these clubs. But in our day, you didn't have to sell merch. The clubs were packed and the clubs were huge. I put this in perspective. You go to a local bar, has 200 people in it, right? You think it's a big bar, right? You think that's big, 250, 300 people. That's a lot of people in a bar. Let me tell you something. The smallest bar we played in held 300 people. The biggest bar we played in held 5,000 people to see cover bands. Can you even wrap your head around that? That does not exist anymore. Right. So you could work your way up and play these gigantic rooms and carry a huge PA system and a huge crew. And that does not exist any longer. So it's very hard for a young person to relate to me, especially when a young person says to me, well, when I say to the, when I say to the person, how many, how many years has your band been together? And they go, oh, two or three years. And I say, well, how many shows have you played in two or three years? And they'll pr proudly tell me 50 to 100 shows. Like that's a big, that's 
big, like 50 to 145 minute shows. I can tell you that in the first 30 months of Twisted Sisters existence, from uh, March 73 to um, the end of August 70, 75, we played uh, 3,450 performances at that point. Think about wow. that for a second. I now, so it's five shows a night, five 40-minute shows a night, six nights a week. So we were able to play, we were able to learn our craft by playing it. So it's not the amount of nights you play, it's how much time you play. Whether you play one 45-minute set a night or two or four or whatever, that's what you do. So we were playing, that was typical in the, our business, five 40-minute sets or four 45-minute sets or three one-hour shows a night. And that's what you did. You played constantly. And, you, you know, we were a show band, so we changed costumes and songs and everything every show. So I racked up 3,400 performances in the first 30 months. Of the, that doesn't exist today. It doesn't no. exist. You know, mm -hmm. so when a 20 year old musician asks me advice, it's about as alien as me <clears throat> at the age of 20 asking uh, a, a musician who is 70 because I'm 71 now. Um, let's just say I asked a 71 year old musician in my neighborhood in New York City in 1972 some advice. OK, right. and I had plenty of those in my neighborhood. Guys were very successful. They were Broadway they played on Broadway shows or they played on commercials or, you know, whatever. But they have a lifelong history of being a musician, professional musician in the union, and they're always working. And if I and I never asked them that question. But if I asked any of them that question in 1972, there would their answer would have been the following. It was said, John, I was born in 1902. <laughs> Think about this. And my first band was in 1918. And, you know, that first band was me playing behind a woman in a ballroom, you know, like a female type lounge singer, yeah. maybe. And he goes, that has nothing to do with you dressed up in women's clothes, clothing, playing through Marshall amplifiers, you know, yeah. playing David Bowie songs has nothing to do with it, man. It's a different world. So it's a different world. And the 20 year old musician today is in a different world. It's not an impossible world, but it's a different world. Yeah. Well, these days, um, for what I understand, and it's legit, I'm telling you right now, I know, um, the kids that do make it these days, they have to go to Hollywood and they have to go to Anton LaVey's old uh, mansion and sell the, their souls to the devil. Tell us about that. Well, you know, listening to Richard uh, Serrett's show one day, he had someone on <laughs> who absolutely said that any person who succeeds in Hollywood, whether it's record business or movies or whatever, have made a, de have made a deal with a cabal of uh, devil worshippers. Mm. And I just thought, like, you know, with all the crazy stuff Richard has, that was just the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. Not a single musician I know is, and I'm not an actor that I, I know plenty of actors and writers, and all these people are just hardworking people. That's all they are. No one's made a deal with the devil. It's a, it was one of those horrible, cliched responses. And I got upset, and, and I sent Richard an email, and I said, I want to debunk it. I want to call out that person. That's a that's a toxic statement to make, and it's nonsense. And it's just more conspiratorial bull. Can I curse yeah. on this thing? It's you just conspiratorial. Say, you can it's swear all you want, man. It's conspiratorial bullshit. It's nonsense, and I got sick of it. You know, so I just said I want to de debunk it. And I didn't think he'd have me on because I because not that he didn't like me, but because Richard is in a business of selling conspiracy concepts you know george yeah. norrie all these guys that's what they do <clears throat> they're in the business of entertainment and that business of entertainment is having wacko people on saying the wackiest shit and they never really call them on it they go they just kind of get bemused by it like the guy that 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 wrote a book about the space force which is in mars right now the thirty-eight thousand people are on mars right now from seven different countries and the mm -hmm. space force that goes back and forth and he's speaking like it's like a regular conversation like no one's he's not being challenged by richard or george nori they go oh really so you were on mars yesterday he goes yeah yeah we, we tried we time traveled back you know but i had lunch on the, the I, I had more on the red planet and i'm thinking nobody goes what the fuck are you talking about? Yeah. Like, why don't they say like, that's the most preposterous shit I ever heard in my life, but they don't. Why? Because they're in the business of entertainment. And they, as Richard said to me on my own, he goes, it's not for him to judge. It's for him to present and right. let you be the judge. Let them sell their book. Yeah. And if you think they're full of shit, they're full of shit. And if you want to believe them, you believe them. So I just questioned it. And yeah. Richard had me on. And and I was very and we became friends from that. I give Richard all the credit in the world. Yeah, and the thing is too, I mean, the more 
I see uh, ludicrous things out there. A lot of it does come to fruition. I'm sure you're aware of that. But at the other end of the coin, you have to keep letting people with even bizarre opinions um, present themselves because we're in a we're in a time of huge censorship, right? And I'm sure that you're aware of YouTube people getting um, deplatformed. You know, famous doctors up until certain date. Um, Facebook, they're deciding what's fact or what's fiction. So, I mean, I, I like the way that you presented this, that Richard does have an obligation to allow the viewer to be. And if you're not smart enough to know the difference, maybe you shouldn't be on social media. Well, I, I give him credit having me on and letting me say it's bullshit. And, and Richard didn't say to me, John, JJ, you're lying. You know, he just let me say my piece. He yeah. let me say my piece. My my truth was, this is nonsense. My truth was, I know nothing of that. That is the most bizarre crap I ever heard. But if you want to believe it, go ahead and believe it. You know, but it's nonsense. Now, let me say this. The myth of rock and roll, the general myth that we as members of the entertainment rock world in general sell, whether it's selling by directly stating it or just by implying is that somehow we became rock stars because of you know some kind of like sex drugs rock and roll fairy dust you know that's how we yeah. did it god forbid it should just be hard work you know god forbid it should just be that we worked really really hard to get there you know that myth of success the 10-year um you know the 10-year uh, overnight sensation mm -hmm. that's part of the that's part of the folklore i guess people want to believe that shit in the same way that people want to believe that every band is stoned out you know, every band's high, right? You got to be high. Never been high on stage in my life, ever. D, never. Mark Mendoza, never. We didn't allow drugs and alcohol. You know, we didn't approve of it. You know, it, 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 band members have a beer here and there if they wanted to drink, although I personally have only had five beers in my entire life. I don't happen to like the taste of beer, neither does D, neither does Mark, because we never had it. But it doesn't matter. The point I'm trying to make is I'm not trying to tell people what to do. Yeah. You do what the hell you want to do. Don't I don't care. But if you think I made it because I'm wasted on cocaine, right? And I made some deal with like the devil, I am not going to support that theory. I'll debunk it. I'll right. debunk it right away and go, it's total bullshit. If people ask me, you know, hey man, you guys look seem like you're wasted. I say, really? How how could I be wasted and work as hard as I did to make it? I did nine thousand yeah. shows. How could I do nine thousand shows? Fucked up. I mean, how does that happen? I mean, think about that rationally for a second. Yeah. You know? How can you play a guitar solo, you know, seamless every night, seven days a week without now, listening a note? But some people can. So you read the Eric Clapton book. He's a high-functioning alcoholic. I happen to love Eric Clapton. I read his book. It was very depressing to see how bad he fell. But, you know, he eventually cleaned himself up. But he was a high-functioning alcoholic. There are high-functioning alcoholics. Mm -hmm. Our original bass player, Kenny, who's on my podcast this week, as a matter of fact, I had him on. He's a wonderful human being. I love the man. Great. Probably the best musician we ever had is our original bass player, Mark, uh, Kenny, Kenneth Harrison Neal. Kenny was a high-functioning alcoholic. Mm -hmm. I didn't know he was an alcoholic. And when he finally told me he was an alcoholic, we concluded that working in bars is not a good place for an alcoholic to be working in. Right. You know, to save his own life. Yeah. So when he left the band, I said, Kenny, you need to save your life and not be in, you know, we weren't famous yet. We were playing in the bars, but God knows he needed to save his life. And playing in a heavy metal band is not going to save his life. He needs to save his life. So he, he left the band to save his life. And he's one of the only ex-members of the band that we stayed friends with because um, he was a really hardworking, wonderful guy, but he had a problem, a substance abuse problem. Now, the irony of the substance abuse problem with him was he uh, joined AA, mm -hmm. and a lot of times they imply or impress uh, or they encourage becoming religious and giving yourself over to a higher power. Okay, right. that's part of the, that's part of the, the I don't want to misstate what AA is. I don't want to misstate what friend of bill means and i don't want to in any way denigrate the great work they do right to saving people's lives all i'm saying is is that in general i understand that they encourage giving yourself over to a higher power that can help you you know get over your al alcoholism and deal with yeah, it the god so of I'm your all, understanding yeah i'm all for that the problem was that the people that he brought down from his church you know saw our show which you know was full of cursing and 
being outrageous, you know, fuck this, fuck that, twist the fucking sister. And they basically said that the devil speaks through me and D. Now, yeah, yeah. I said to Kenny, Kenny, me and D are not the one with the drinking problem. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you are. I said, the devil, I said, the devil's not talking to me and D. I said, that's one of those kind of um, generalized, fictional, nonsensical things that people say and i'll fight against them but the record label our record label when they found out we were straight that really bothered them they said don't tell people you're straight man do not tell people you say they'll ruin your reputation i said you know how silly that sounds mm -hmm. you know how ridiculous that sounds that i'm in the only business where telling people you don't get fucked up will ruin your reputation I mean, in any other business you tell people you're fucked up you're fucked yeah you're, you're done you know a politician finds himself in a hotel room with a 16 year old girl on cocaine He's done, right? Yeah. If an athlete, sports star winds up in a hotel room with a 16 year old and with cocaine, you're pretty much done. Mm -hmm. But if a rock musician winds up in a hotel with a 16 year old girl, you get a Grammy. <laughs> I think, you know. Yeah, yeah, I think I know who you're referring to. Yeah. Yeah, they, they name an album after you or something, you know. It's, it's insane. <laughs> it um, wanted to touch base. Oh, by the way, I'm going to check out that podcast with Kenny. Where can uh, people go to uh, to view that and sign up? Yeah, Spotify, which everybody in the world has. The J.J. Yeah. French Connection Beyond the Music. That's the name of the podcast. Yeah. The J.J. French Connection Beyond the Music. There's about 100 interviews on there. Kenny's this week. Okay. I've got some great people coming up. In fact, if you're a musician, you're going to love the month of August because August is going to be Record Company President Month where I have a president of a record label on every week, a different label. Wow. On every week. The current so president. Current um, labels like Frontiers or yeah, like, well, even bigger Lava Rhino. We're talking oh, wow. bigger, bigger labels. Well, um, actually, uh, Blue Grape, which is a new label started out by Dave Rath, who's like who's who signed Slipknot and you know some of the biggest bands in the world. Just started his own label. He's got um, um, Code Orange on his label, like a lot of hot new artists, and he's been mm -hmm. around for years and years and years. He's on. Cliff Chenfeld, who was the president of Razor and Tie, which was the biggest indie label in the history of the United States, he's on. A lot of people giving their perspective on the music industry. And Jason sure. Flom, of course, our A&R guy, who's one of the most legendary record people in the history of the music industry. You know, he only had, he only signed Kid Rock. He signed, you know, Twisted Sister. He signed Zebra. Um, he signed Matchbox 20. He signed Sugar Ray. Um, he, you know, he signed um, Katy Perry to her first record deal. I mean, we're not talking, we're talking mega, right? Yes. Mega, mega, mm -hmm. mega. He's currently got Black Veil Brides on his label. Wow. Um, so he's, you know, these are great people to have on, on my show. So my show deals with musicians, producers, record company presidents, artists, uh, uh, um, audio, I'm an audiophile. So I've got audiophile guys on the show discussing, you know, the insanity of high-end audio, yeah. um, yeah. which is a whole other world. Uh, I'm going to have watch guys on because I also happen to be into watches. And so I'll have an episode of that. So it's a, it's a pretty wide ranging. And also because of my various health issues, uh, both prostate cancer and atrial fibrillation, I've had my doctors on to discuss that. Awesome. Because um, there's like a segue in here. I was going to ask you about the prostate cancer. Um, obviously, we don't want to get uh, dinged because you're giving a medical advice, but you've you survive prostate cancer. Tell the um, viewers your personal symptoms and maybe what they should look out for based on your opinion, uh, John. Well, I wouldn't get dinged at all. I do these all the time. I do these okay. talks all the time and I give very general, very general observations. I okay. don't tell anybody how to treat their shit. It's Perfect. not my job. You have a doctor, you have your doctor to go to. Yeah. All I'm going to say is, is that if you're a man over 50, you should have your blood tested for your PSA level. That's the first thing that's going to let you know if you have a prostate issue. And many people have prostate cancer. In fact, these days, it just seems every other day I'm getting a phone call from a friend who's got prostate cancer. So you should find out if you if you have prostate cancer or you're heading towards that direction. So that's important to go for a physical and get a blood test and they'll do a digital exam with a finger up the butt. That's what they do. And they'll take a blood test and they'll give you an idea of what your PSA, which is your pros uh, prostate specific antigen, that's PSA. And hmm. from there... From there, once you once you have that information, if you have a general doctor, he will probably suggest a urologist, at which point then you will be dealing with that whole world. And that whole world can be many, many, many things. And there's many, many, many options. It is no longer a death sentence. That we do know for a fact. It's one of the most treatable cancers. We do know that for a fact. That's not me speaking nonsense. It is one of the most treatable cancers. Get it early enough and you know you survive. 
Um, uh, I have plenty of survivor friends. Um, my father died of prostate cancer, though, okay, undiagnosed. And my brother and I kind of looked at it and said, I wonder if we're going to be in that gene pool. And so we started we started really paying attention to our health at a young age. And, and we were both diagnosed, and we caught it early enough. And oh, so so you, you, but, and also, I have people who have a prostate cancer on my show. Prostate, celebrities, prostate cancer, Rob Halford from Judas Priest. Yep. You know, William King from the Commodores. These guys have all been on my show because um, it, because because we all say this as a general rule, get yourself checked, get yourself to the doctor, have, you know, if you're over 50, especially say, hey, man, can you do a PSA test? I want to see where things are at. You owe it to yourself. You owe it to your family. Your right. Right. To survive. So that's not controversial. That's just common sense. Okay. Yeah. And from there, go online or wherever you are. I'm sure you'll find a lot of different ways to treat it. There's so many different ways to treat it now that didn't exist, you know, years ago. Yeah. There's a lot of options. I also had atrial fibrillation, which is an irregular heartbeat caused by an electrical malfunction of the heart, which a lot of people also suffer from. It's very uncomfortable. And it's also the leading cause of stroke. That's not uh, a theory of mine. It's always advertised. It says you have a six percent, a six six times greater chance of stroke with AFib if it's untreated, oh. because the because the um, electrical malfunction of the heart causes an irregular heartbeat, and when that happens, you could uh, a piece of plaque could break off in the valve and 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 cause a stroke. Not me scaring anybody. That just happens to be a statistical fact. It's spoken about in commercials all the time. Again, if you have an irregular heartbeat. Get it checked out. Sometimes you can feel it. Sometimes you can't. But if you have AFib, there's plenty of ways to solve AFib. I had a particularly chronic version of AFib, and um, I needed two procedures. I needed the first one failed. And uh, it was a brand new procedure at the time, which involved um, no open heart surgery, all catheters, which, which, by the way, you know, better living through chemistry. You know, 30 years ago, they would have opened you up for it. Now yeah. they put catheters in. Unfortunately, the guy who did my procedure did not do it well. And when they took the catheters out, um, they tore my heart muscle, flooded my chest with 400 cc's of blood, collapsed my lung, and put me in the ICU. And wow. that was the first. That was the first attempt to to cure it. Uh, the second attempt um, was totally successful. Went to a different hospital, and uh, I'm not that laughing. Was, that. I'm sorry. I'm not laughing. It's <laughs> just that you said the first attempt by the first individual was unsuccessful. Um, but the second attempt was successful. We went to a different doctor. Yeah. Yeah. I, different hospital, different doctor. Yeah. I don't want to get into, um, I told that story. I'm not going to specifically state it so that you don't feel that you're in a situation where I'm not going to mention the doctors. I'm not going to mention the hospital. No, I will, for just, sure. I, I will just say this as a general rule. If you've got health issues, don't stick your head in the sand. Research them. First, speak yeah. to your doctor. Speak to your doctor. Do research, and and ask questions, and 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 then eventually, a solution will appear. Yeah. Because you've done your research. Just everybody that has any kind of health issue will do that. Your doctor says you got this. What are you going to do? You're going to listen, and then you're going to go check it out. You're going to talk to friends. Do go online, which everybody does. Atrial fibrillation is also a disease that's 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 curable mostly now, which is great. And uh, it used to be they had to open you up to cure it. Now they do it through catheters, which is wonderful. Mm -hmm. No open heart surgery. That's great. You know, and mine was done 17 years ago. So I think that the advancement of catheterization is way far advanced than it was 17 years ago. I think 17 years ago it was four catheters and they're down to two now. You know, everything gets smaller. You know what I mean? As time goes on, yep. everything gets better, more efficient, smaller. Um, uh, you know what's going to – here's the funny thing. In 100 years from now, two doctors are going to have a talk about a uh, disease and they'll go, they used to open you up for that? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I – that um... – for sure. It'd be like back in the olden days, they used to cut you open and hold your muscles out with um, clamps and go in there and say, what? Get out of here. Yeah. Now it's it's uh, it's amazing. It's amazing what, what modern science can do. Um, but that but that's just my general thing. And my daughter has an eye disease called uveitis, which I raise money for the foundation. 
it's an eye disease that's a leading cause of blindness among um, one of the leading causes of blindness among young girls in America, oh. probably in Canada, the same percentage. Um, it's a uh, it's a really weird eye disease, and um, it's not glaucoma, but it is the um, the destruction of the uvea lens. So you probably don't even know that you have a lens called the uvea. You probably think it's some sex organ or something, or you think uveitis is UV rays. No, the uvea is the middle lens of your eye of three lenses. And if that lens gets blocked up with, with cells that connect to it, it's because it thinks it's under attack. And if the cells stay on the lens, it will eat the lens up and cause blindness. So you have to take the cells off the lens. Mm -hmm. Well, how do you take the cells off the lens? You take it off with either prednisone, eye drops, which oh, wow. by the way will, will lead to blindness if you overdo that or through systemic anti-inflammatory drugs. Um, we found the, you know how like every every city in the world has a heart doctor, colon cancer doctor, breast cancer doctor, there's millions of them, they're all over the world. There's only one worldwide specialist in this disease. Is one. that right? Wow. Yeah, one. And he trains all the doctors in the world about this disease. And his doctor's name is Stephen Foster. Okay. And he has, he has an organization in Canada. So if you're listening to this and you think your child has some sort of a vision problem right. and you should check your da your da daughters especially at the age of six and if they're diagnosed with uveitis um you can go online if you want but if you're smart you'll call directly you'll call the ocular immunology and uveitis foundation the oiuf that's located in boston and you'll fly to boston you'll meet with with dr foster or one of his trained doctors because i'm not this is not me saying, oh, he's my doctor, so go to him. This is me telling you he's the only guy in the world, okay. and he trains okay. all the people. So if you have uveitis, you are either seeing Dr. Foster or you're going to one of the people that he has trained. Am I clear about yeah. that? Yeah. And yeah. I do this as a public service, as a public service announcement, because this disease, if it's caught early, is controllable, and your child will not lose their eyesight. But if, if this disease hits your child at the age of six, which is when it hit my daughter, and we did not get to a doctor until she was nine, when she started to actually know the symptoms because she was having vision problems, mm -hmm. the damage done in that three years is irreparable. Wow. So my daughter was caught roughly six months after the disease hit. The disease is an orphan's disease, meaning it doesn't necessarily get get involved with other diseases. But if you have juvenile rheumatoid arthritis, which a lot of kids do, so yeah. parents pay attention. If your child has rheumatoid arthritis, chances are, if it's a girl, she'll develop uveitis. Yeah. As a father, I am just telling you, you love your kid, yeah. pay attention. That's all. Pay attention. So those doctors, they're all on my podcast. My my, da my daughter's uveitis specialist on my podcast. Yeah. My cardiologist is on my podcast. My urologist is on my podcast because I am trying to educate people yeah, and save lives. I'm not promoting one thing or another. Yeah. I'm promoting knowledge. Well, I wish I would have known about Dr. Foster when I was growing up because quite often I would be calling into work saying I'm having a problem with my vision. I'm not coming in today. And they would say, you know, what's wrong? And I'd say, well, I just can't see myself coming in today. So what ultimately happened? John, you didn't get the joke. Oh, I can't see myself coming. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm I missed sorry. a bit of your humor. It's that Canadian thing. I'm it, sorry. Well, yeah, um, the Canadian. <laughs> and I've got a deadpan way of delivery. Sometimes you do. I'm here, I'm here talking about some really serious thing. Like, I can't see myself coming in. Okay, I got yeah. it. <laughs> Well, hey, John, thanks for your time. I've got just a couple quick things here for the viewers that are going to be interested. Um, do you play any shows um, musically in the in the Brooklyn area, uh, aside from a, you know, a Twisted Sister engagement here and there? Or is that part of your life out, out now and you're focusing more on your, your motivational speaking? I'm, I'm concentrating on the speaking engagements, but um, I, I, I will show up as a special guest with people when they ask me to. Okay, perfect. And I'm actually in Manhattan, not Brooklyn. I kind of use Brooklyn because it's just a funny, you know, because there's a lot of funny jokes about Brooklyn. Like, you know what the Brooklyn alphabet is? Do you have any idea? No, I never heard that one. 
fucking A, fucking B, fucking C, fucking D. That that that's the Brooklyn alphabet. Okay, so um, that's great. So so anyway, I'm in Manhattan, and um, I have plenty of musician friends, and if they ask me to come around and and, and jam or show up at a gig, I'll show up and play a song or two. But in general, I don't I don't play. Okay, um, what's the opposite of unsubscribe? Subscribe. Everybody subscribe to the channel for these great interviews from great interviewees, just like JJ French. Go out and get the book. And last question, I think I said that three times ago, but this is the last question. Favorite Canadian musician, rock star, talent, um, who would you say? Well, um, you know, I'm a Joni Mitchell fan. I'm a Brian Adams fan. I'm a, the band. I consider the band one of the greatest rock groups in the history of the music industry. Mm -hmm. Levon Helm, you know, all those guys. They're a Canadian. It was a Canadian band. Robbie Robertson, if I'm not mistaken, they're a Canadian yeah. band. I think they're yeah. one of the greatest bands ever. Yeah. Um, you have an audio company called Sim Audio in Canada, which is one of the greatest high end audio companies in the world. Uh, I'm having to be friends with those guys up there. They're extremely talented. I love Canada. Twisted Sister had an amazing career in Canada. We sold more records per capita in Canada than any other country. I read um, that, yeah. Yeah, when you sell a million records in America, you sell 100,000 copies in Canada. We sold 3 million in America, sold 700,000 copies of Stay Hungry in Canada, for example. But wow. I will tell you one of the, the really quickly funny, funny yeah. touring story. Yeah. So Twisted Sister around 2012, 13, around there, we played in Edmonton. We played a uh, outdoor music festival in Edmonton two week long festival with a lot of artists and we were just driving through and, and, and we were set up when we get to the back area of this particular area. In, now, if you can picture the Edmonton mall is gigantic, right? And yeah. the area around it is gigantic. So they had like many, um, uh, theaters set up all around, I guess, because there was hundreds of thousands of people walking around in this two week outdoor mall. And, um, we pull up in the backstage area and uh, and the trailer directly across from us had the band name on the on the door, like our name says Twisted Sister. Mm -hmm. And what it said was Bob the Builder. And I went, is that a band? Like, I didn't know. Right. <laughs> so I thought, oh, that's got to be like an alternative rock band. Bob the Builder. Like, what do I know? <laughs> right? Sounds cute. Bob the Builder. Got to got to be an alternative band because, you know, you got a lot of a lot of interesting bands there you know triumph is there Brockman. by the way bachman turner overdrive it and guess who are another yeah the more i think about Rand, the more i think about randy bachman the more i think about burton cummings i can start telling you about musicians who i really loved and loved to listen to but yeah. anyway it says bob the builder so i so i went it says security guard i go what is that he goes it's a television show for kids <laughs> and i go what is that doing is there a performance going on what is that what is the fuck is bob the building goes oh yeah he's on now so i walk over to this backstage area I walk up and there's the the guy bob the builder with his i guess his marionettes whatever the fuck he's got i don't know what he, exactly what it is but the whole point is that there's twenty thousand four year olds in the arena with their parents and i am freak the fuck out going that is who we're playing to today like we're we're bob the builder is the opening act of twisted <laughs> fucking sister are you fucking kidding me so i walk over to the promoter i go what the fuck we're going on after that and he goes trust me trust me you're going on in three hours they will all clear out and 20,000 dirt bags will replace them. They're all out there. You, they just haven't been in here yet, you know? So I immediately put a hoodie on and walked the whole perimeter and yeah. saw, you know, like metal people, you yeah, know, yeah, saw yeah, my people. Yeah. Everyone's wearing, you know, motorcycle jackets and, you know, jean jackets and all that shit. And I'm like, yeah, my people. So, you know, in the three hours in between Bob the Builder and us, all the parents left with their kids and all of our fans came in. That was just a weird, one of the weirdest things. That'd be a great title. Bob the Builder opens up for Twisted Sister. Yeah, that's it. Well, they did. Okay. Bob the Builder. Bob the fucking Builder. <laughs> <laughs> well, the reason I was pointing up here, and I don't, I, I don't have any um, patience today to edit anything in there. Um, you know who that is? I was asking you a famous Canadian. You know, I'm not a big tennis fan, so I can only start 
going through names of who I could think it would be. Clister, I don't, I don't know who, who, which, who, who is this one? I this is know. a Canadian. Um, my ex pretend fictional girlfriend, Jeannie Bouchard. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'm trying That's to get her on the show. So. Oh, good. Well, is she um, is she in one of the top ten? No, but she's uh, one of the top ten on Instagram. <laughs> oh, well, if she's got that thing going for her, we're, oh we're... yeah. Well, she's dating a football player too. He's actually real. I'm not real, but um, no, I've been trying to get an interview with her, but just for whatever reason, I just choose a great tennis player in her day. Anyways, this isn't about tennis. So, <laughs> anyways, thanks for joining me, uh, JJ. I'll put all the links down below so people can go to the podcast and get a copy of that book. And uh, once again, thanks for taking the time out of your uh, busy day. Remember guys, you can buy this on Amazon, Twisted Business, available now, listen to my podcast. Um, I also write for two magazines, Goldmine and Copper. And Goldmine is a music magazine, Copper is a music magazine that is out on a, online at psaudio.com. They're an audio uh, portal that features copper, which is their magazine. And my article is called Twisted Systems. And it's my take on the music industry. So please, thank you for being supportive. Thank the Canadian, the Canadian fans for being incredibly supportive of Twisted Sister and making us one of the biggest fans of the 80s. Thanks to Much Music for really promoting the hell out of Twisted Sister when they could have chosen not to. Mm -hmm. And they did. And we'd like to thank the, the tour that we did in 84 with Iron Maiden, I want to thank Iron Maiden. We went from um, Halifax, Nova Scotia to Vancouver and everywhere in between. And I spent the coldest night of my life in fucking Winnipeg. All right. Yeah. The coldest night of my whole fucking life was in Winnipeg. And one thing I'll say about 40 Below Zero. Yeah. There are no drug dealers on the street. <laughs> 40 Below Zero. Yeah, I can imagine. I think it's Portage in Maine is in a, a Randy Bachman song, and uh, they say that's one of the coldest uh, street corners in uh, Canada or the world. So yeah, yeah, they're from Winnipeg, aren't they? If I'm not, um, I could. I, I'm definitely not gonna, you know, bet a quarter on it, but I. Pretty sure that they're close to being from Manitoba and Winnipeg. Yeah. Yeah. Well, great, great, uh, really great. The country is beautiful. I, I drove the Canadian Rockies. I drove from 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 Vancouver to uh, to Banff and into into um, uh, Calgary to watch the Calgary Stampede, mm -hmm. uh, and and drove across the Canadian Rockies. And as much as the American Rockies are big and beautiful, the Canadian Rockies are bigger. And even less people in them. I think I'm the only guy. I think I, my car was the only car because I got busted for speeding. And the cop said, don't tell me you're following anybody else because there's nobody up here. <laughs> well, you, you should know. have said, well, why are you giving me a ticket? Because who am I going to hit? Yeah. You know what he said to me? No. He said, there's a reason why there's speed limits on these roads because they're dangerous roads. And he was right. There were some real turns okay. up there that you could just, you could see people went through the bricks. They went through them. You know, you got to be careful. Anyway, I thank you for your time. I don't want to take any more of it. No, no. But no. I appreciate you contacting me and being a yeah. fan of Richard's. I'd like to thank Richard for for uh, pushing me e even as, well, a, as a person. One quick thing. Was it when you got pulled over, was it a Mountie? Um, yeah. Well, he, yes, it was. As a okay. So a Mountie saved J.J. French's life. <laughs> Good headline. Thanks, man. All right. Yeah. Thanks, John. Thank you. Take care. Thank you.